Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. And um, today's, thank you. Today, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about an encounter that I had with God for the last 33 years, almost 34. So I was born and raised in Guatemala. And that's clear south of Mexico. It's not part of Mexico. I don't speak Mexican. I don't speak Guatemalan. Right? We speak Spanish. I've, I have a lot of people who ask me, so what do you guys speak over there? Guatemalan? I'm like, no, we, we speak Spanish. Thank you. Uh, but so I was born to... Uh, both my parents and my, my dad, as he grew up, he was a Catholic, going to church every Sunday, going to church very faithfully. Uh, when uh, uh, Holy Week came, they would do all the things that the, uh, the, the Catholic faith uh, asks of them. But dad knew that there was something about his Catholic faith that he couldn't reconcile, and he just did not know what it was. Uh, at the time, Dad was working at the Department of Defense down in Guatemala, and my mom was doing an internship as an administrative assistant. Now, uh, that's what they're called, but back in the day, they were called secretaries, right? Uh, but now they're called administrative assistants. Um, and so, Dad started hanging out with my mom, and at the time, he was dating somebody else, but... As he got to know my mom, he realized there is something special about this woman. And he broke up with the other one and started dating my mom. Um, nine months later, I came. And they got married the following year. At the time, mom really was in that church. She grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Her mom was a Seventh-day Adventist. And her grand grandfather was a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and so my family is very well known down in Guatemala. Well, it was. Um, and, um, but mom was not part of the church at the time. So mom and dad would go out dancing and they would stay all night out doing, doing, uh, doing that kind of life. And there were days where dad, usually during, during the weekends, dad would disappear. He was into drugs and he was uh, uh, into alcohol. And so he would disappear the entire weekend. And when he would return on Sundays, my grandmother had usually a meal prepared for him. And that's when my dad and my grandmother would start talking. And my grandmother began, began to give him Bible studies. So I was born 17 August 1983, and my parents got married on 25 February 2000, no, 2000, 1984. Shortly thereafter, my dad was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And within a few months of him being baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there was a, uh, there was a, a, a member who said, hey, we need to do something around our church, and we're going to go knocking on doors. We're going to do in-gathering. He had no idea what in-gathering was, and of course they asked the volunteers, and my dad rose his, you know, rose his hand and said, I can, I can volunteer. Didn't know that that included knocking on doors. But he did, and he loved it. And then he began doing evangelism from there. Dad was uh, an evangelist down in Guatemala, and he was also uh, very, um, very into church planting. And so at the age of about seven, we left our big church and we moved into a home for Sabbath worship. And soon 
the five or six people that met were what, 30, and then 50, and then 100. And the way Dad did that was, number one, he was faithful to the Word of God, and number two, he loved getting people together to do anything and everything, what we call fellowship. And so we would go playing basketball, we would go hiking, uh, we would go to, to the ruins, uh, the Mayan ruins, and we would just do things like that with the entire church, and the entire church loved it. And so people would invite their friends like, hey, we're going to go do these, come and join us. We had such a good time. And so they would go, they would join. And soon the church began to grow because one, they were faithful to the word of God, and two, there was a lot of fellowship where not a single sermon was ever preached. Not a single sermon. And so that's the environment I grew up in. My mom, she used to sing. And so did my older brother. And so when I came of age, of about seven, I remember standing in the square, at a square, at a park, and singing to a bunch of strangers. I was terrified. At the age of 10, I joined my first Pathfinder club. For those of you who don't know what Pathfinder is, is, is the equivalent of Boy Scouts for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so as they knew me as the preacher's kid, we had a speaking competition. And they said, hey, why don't you speak? Right? Your dad can write you the sermon, and you just have to memorize it and preach it. Now, at the age of 10, and we have about... I don't know, five, seven hundred kids out there in, a, in the, in the, in the uh, campery. And when my turn came, the only thing I remember is starting to cry. And I cried the entire sermon. Needless to say, I didn't win. <laughs> but that began my ministry uh, for Jesus. At the age of uh, 12, in one of my dad's evangelistic series, he, he told me, I remember this exactly, he said, I want you to sit in the grown-ups meeting. I don't want you to go into the little kids. I think it's time for you to start thinking about baptism. And I said, okay. So I, 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 I was in the meetings, and after, at the end of the meetings, I, I was baptized. 28 May, 1994. And so as I'm growing up, I began to hang out with the wrong crowd at school. And I began smoking. No big deal. Dad always said, I can smell smoke in your clothes, so if I ever smell that kind of smell on you, well, you can... Imagine the rest. <laughs> so, my best friend, his parents smoke. So that was a great excuse. I was just at my friend's house, and they'd smoke, so therefore I have the smell. But in 2001, a letter came from the embassy. And at that, that letter said, congratulations, you have been selected or you have been granted an interview at the embassy, at the United, uh, the United States of America embassy. And my dad recalls that the first one came and he thought, well, this is a mistake. So he put it away. Then the second one come and he did the same thing. Oh, it's a mistake. The third one came and he decided to investigate. 
So he went to my mom and said, hey, you know anything about this? And my mom says, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> she had put the paperwork without my dad's consent because my dad did not want to come to America. And so we went through the process, and, and, and a year after that, we got our letter saying, congratulations, you've been granted your green card. You are welcome to come into the United States. You have six months to depart. Six months. At this point, I had graduated from, from high school. I had my group of friends. I knew what I was, what, what I was doing. But Dad said, we're all going. And I was so mad when Dad says, we're all going. Because that meant I had to leave my family, my, all my friends behind. And I didn't want to. But from a young age, I knew. Remember, at the age of seven, I started singing. From that t moment on, I knew that I was going to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. And if you ask every pastor, they will tell you they do not want to be pastors. There are very few pastors that will tell you, yes, I wanted to be a pastor from the young age. But most of us will tell you that we fought that call. And I fought that call, so I enrolled. We came to the States, and of course, I don't know anything of English. I am just, Spanish is the language I've been speaking for 19 years. I don't know anything. So I began to learn. We came to Wisconsin. Out of all the states, we came into Wisconsin uh, in September. <laughs> 8 September 2002, we came into the states. And of course, it's cold. Wisconsin is now not just for their cheese, but also because it's cold. And so I'm standing. I, I got a job at Walmart pushing carts. And I remember standing at the, at the um, uh, bus stop at 6 in the morning with a jacket that is so big that it gets it, it, it's up to, uh, down to my knees and so bulky that I feel like I'm the Michelin man. <laughs> and at 7.30 every day, my shift would start. Rain, shine, or snowed, I push carts. After about a year, I was promoted, not to manager, but to work in the furniture department. And then, one day, as I'm going back from work, there's a small voice in the back of my head with two ideas. Military service and pastoral ministry. Now, up until now, I did not want anything to do with ministry. And that was not anything different. So I followed the voice that said military service. So I went to the recruiters, who actually got home, looked in the computer, asked for some, for some uh, information about the Navy, because I thought, well, the, the Marines, they're the first ones to go. I don't have a death wish. Okay, the Air Force, now nah, that's might as well be a civilian, right? <laughs> the Army, I was like, mm -mm, too big. <laughs> they don't do anything fun. All they do is land stuff. So the only one that was left was the, Mar the, was the, was the Navy. And I thought, and you know, it's like, join the Navy, see the world. I wanted to see the world. So I requested the, the, the information, and I... And, and within days, it arrived. But within, also within days, a phone call was made, and I answered and said, hey, I'm Petty Officer so, such and such, and I'm a Navy recruiter, and I would love to work with you. Any questions you got, please let me know. So I went in the next day before work. I went in, because at this time, I'm working 3 to midnight. Um, and he said, not a problem. And he answered all kinds of questions, and he said, so when do you want to go to MEPS? MEPS, Medical Entry Processing Station, right? And I'm like, I don't know. 
when do you think I should go? He's like, well, you can go tomorrow if you want to. I'm like, okay. Good to go. So I went, and as I'm, I, I, I got checked. Um, those of you who've been in the Navy or the military know that you go through all that process of eyes, blood, uh, all kinds of stuff. At, and towards the end, you see an actual medical person, the doctor. And as I'm, as I'm standing there with my trousers down and so in my underwear, <laughs> that's what you do, he realizes that one of my testicles is bigger than the other one. And he said, and he asked the question, how long have this testicle been bigger than the other one? I said about four months. He said, does it hurt when you walk? I said, yes. Yes, it does. He said, I think you have testicular cancer. I'm 21 years old. I want to join the Navy. The last thing I want to hear is you have testicular cancer and you can't join. Within a week, I was, it was confirmed that it was cancer. So the Navy said, sorry, we can't take you. You're medically disqualified. Move on with your life. Within a week, I was with the doctors. No chemo, no radiation. Thankfully, it was stage one cancer. The only thing that they did was CT scans and sometimes PET scans to make sure that my lymph nodes were cancer free. But as I'm standing, as I'm, I'm sitting in my car waiting for the recruiter to take me to do some other testing to make sure that it is cancer, I remember praying this prayer. Because remember, I, I'm struggling with the call of being a pastor. I don't want to be a pastor. So I'm sitting there and I make a deal with God. And I told him, God, if you don't want me to join the Navy, let this be cancer. But if you want me to join the Navy, then let it be. I mean, it, the, the, you know, take it away. If you want me to be a minister, take, you know, don't take it away. Sure enough, it was cancer. Six months later, I left Wisconsin for Tennessee to Southern Adventist University where I obtained my bachelor's in theology. And that's where I met my wife, at a breakfast table. But if you knew me at the time, you would know that I don't do breakfast. Anything before 10 o'clock is too early. <laughs> but my classes had started at 8. And so I would have to eat breakfast. And I saw her one day, and I went and I sat across from her, and I enjoyed making her blush all kinds of reds. <laughs> That's what, that was my thing. And I said, hey, why don't we go out? And she had heard a few things about me from the grapevine, okay, that were not, you know, that she thought, no, I don't want to date this guy. And her thing was perfect because the next year, she was headed, she was headed to China for 10-month missionary work to teach English. And so she, her, her excuse was, you know what? I don't want to start anything right now because I'm leaving for China. I said, okay. I moved on for 10 months. But as she came back, her roommate and friend that went to China had a crush on my roommate. Uh-huh. So her roommate would tell my wife, hey, why don't you call Jose and invite them over for lunch or supper? And so Sarah would be like, okay. You know, their roommate, her roommate and my roommate are now married to somebody else. <laughs> it took two years of convincing her that I was worthy of her Amen. for her to say yes to be, marry me. Shortly thereafter, I finished my, th my degree in theology. As, a, as I'm doing my theology, I'm thinking, you know what, I, I can do something else. So I took the LSAT. I want to be a lawyer. 
But then as I, as I graduated, I did not get a call to any church. And I thought, well, I've done my job. I came to study. A job didn't show up. Therefore, I've done what, I, what God called me to do. Now I can do something else. So I told my wife one day, I'm joining the Marine Corps as, a, in a, as, a, as an officer. And she said, over my dead body. <laughs> we've, made, we've been married for six months. You're in, you ain't leaving me. Three months? Okay. I've been telling this story wrong. It's been three months since we got married, and she said no. And, I, and I'm thinking still military service. So I began to look at what I could do with my degree, and out of the sudden, in the Navy, I look at this, and it says chaplain. And I started to investigate what chaplains did in the military, and I thought, you know, it's something I could do. So we left to... Anderson University at the seminary in 2010. We had our first child, Elijah. He's right there. He's raising his hand. Um, and after 36 uh, hours of labor and four hours of pushing with no, medi with no medicine whatsoever for the pain, my son was born with the umbilical cord ra wrapped around his neck, and he had also inhaled his own defecation as he's coming out. So he's blue. And so he gets the attention of the nurses, and he gets transported to a bigger hospital um, down in Indiana, because the one that, where he was born was not big enough in Michigan. And as he is checked in into the uh, NICU, the, neo, the neonatal um, ICU, the doctor calls my wife and tells her. Now, she just endured 36 hours of labor, four of pushing, and the doctor calls her and says, your son is very sick. It'll be a miracle if he survives. And if he does, it'll be probably about 30 days before he comes out of the hospital. Not, not something that a first-time parent wants to hear. And so we began, and this is why I love Facebook, because we put the prayer request on Facebook. And within hours, we had people all around the world, actually, literally, all around the world praying for Elijah. This was on a Tuesday, August 16, 2001, 2011. By Saturday, my son is being discharged out of the hospital. The doctor could not, could not understand what happened. And to this day, the doctor does not know what happened because it's not normal. It's not something that happens. A year later, my wife got pregnant again. And... I had just returned from military, from military school. By now, I'm an ensign in the United States Navy as a chaplain candidate. Loved it. Had a lot of fun. My wife gets pregnant. And something happened as we are, we are, as we are transitioning into this. And my wife lost the baby. Ten weeks. And that prompted something in my brain. My, 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 my brain did not make sense of it. Of the tragedy that we had just under, undergone. And I remember arguing with God. By the way, arguing with God is not sinful. Okay? Arguing with God is not sinful. How you argue with God might be sinful. He's a big boy. He can take whatever it is that you dish at him. Okay? So I began to argue with God and say, God, why, do you allow, why did you allow this to happen? 
if you're going to treat me this way, even though I'm trying to do what you asked me to do, if you're going to allow these things to happen to me, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with you. And so for about six months, I was an atheist, an agnostic, whatever you want to call it. I did not believe in God. But I was also six months from finishing my degree, my master's degree. So I said, you know, I've come all the way this way. And to not finish my degree, that would have been a waste of money. So I'm taking my last semester, and as I'm reading the writings of, of Martin Luther and John Calvin and all of these great patriarchs that we, that we hear, I begin to notice that there is something within the writings, and the common thread is that they all fight with God, one way or another. They all fight with God. But in the end, their faith only grows. So I told God, okay, God, I'll give you one more chance. We want a church, or we want to be hired out west. We don't want to go down south. We don't want to stay in, in the Midwest. We want to go to western Washington. And the church or the churches have to be near a school. I sent out my resume to all the conferences except few, um, like Arizona, because we didn't want to be in the desert. So we sent it to uh, Washington Conference and, George, and, and Upper Columbia Conference. And within a few days, the former ministerial director for Upper Columbia Conference, Gerald Hager, gave me a call and said, hey, I'm in the seminary. I received your resume, and I would love to talk with you. Uh, okay. Upper Columbia Conference, where is that at? Eastern Washington. Not what I want to be. But hey, it's out west. And um, he told me, he, then he told me about three churches, Othello, Quincy, and, and Ephrata. And we came to interview in 2013 in June. We were here from 8 June through 11 June. The interview goes well. And on that Sunday, my landlord calls from Michigan. And he, the landlord says, Mr. Monzon, you um, need to be out of the house by 1 July or 30 June because on 1 July, I have a new tenant coming in. And I'm thinking, there's no way I can do that. I don't have a job. So I explained that to her and she said, I'm sorry, you have to be out by 1 July. We're like, okay, that's fine. Ten minutes later, there is a, another phone call, and on the other line is a representative of the Upper Columbia Conference saying, hey, we just finished our meeting with all three churches, and unanimously, you have been offered the job. If you would like to come and pastor at the Upper Columbia Conference, this is your official invitation. We said, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and we were out of our home in Michigan by 28 June. We traveled and we got here on 3 July, 2013. And for three years, we did ministry in the Upper Columbia Conference. But in, in the year of 2015, right around July time frame, a desire again for military service came. But by then, we already had three churches. My wife found some great friends. My kids had some good friends, and so I said to God, you know what? No, God, I, I don't want to do that because I'm pretty good here. I'm okay. But 
the desire just kept growing and growing and growing. And finally, in November, 30 November of 2015, I went to a conference down in Daytona Beach. And the very first night of that conference, and that conference was an evangelism, by the way. That conference, the very first night, the pastor said, preach a sermon on the, on the life of Joseph. And, and he said, God gave Joseph a dream for his life and for his ministry, even before he began to do that. So the question is, what has God, what picture has God given you for your life and your ministry? And the only two things that came to my mind, once again, was military service and pastoral ministry. And for three days, I began to wrestle with God. And I said, God, I don't want to do these. I don't want to do these, God. You know, and finally I said to God, God, if you want me to do this, you have to send a sign, a, 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 an unequivocal sign that you are calling me to this. That was 3 December. 5 December, I received an email from the recruiter in Seattle. I have not requested any information, but the recruiter calls, uh, emails me and says, Mr. Monzon, I'm EA, EA2 Winchester, and I'm a recruiter for chaplains in Washington. Going through my records, all records, we noticed that you requested information about chaplaincy about two years ago, and we're just following up to see if you would like to do if you're interested, if you are, please respond to this email, and I would love to work with you and process your, your, your application. Okay, I said, okay, God, that's where you're headed. And I said, God, that's what it is. Came back. I went to my conference president and ministerial director, and I said, this is what it is. And they said, okay. If God is leading you that way, let us know how we can help you. So for the next six months, I began to do the process. And throughout the process, there were plenty of, of time when nothing moved. So when nothing moves, I get bored, and I began to look other places. And an, and an opening for an associate youth director opened up for in the Upper Columbia Conference, which I thought, hey, that's an opportunity for me to do, to do something else. The day that I call my, my, my ministerial director and president, they're both out of the office to express my interest in this position. Two hours later, the recruiter called and said, hey, Mr. Monzon, Regent has been asking, to, asking us to put your package. And there is a possibility that your package goes in by the end of June. What does your weekend look like? And I said, it just up and up. By 21 July, I was in the Pentagon in front of eight captains, 06s in the, in the Navy. Seven of them were chaplains and one was a line officer. And they began to ask questions. And they began to ask questions. By 29 July, I received a phone call saying, congratulations, you've been selected for the chaplain corps. And I said, praise the Lord. By 16, 16 August, my son's birthday, my detailer calls, the one who plays us in different uh, places, the, find, the one who finds us the jobs, he said, congratulations, you are going to Naval Base Kitsap. Now, I had come to interview with a chaplain here. He did my interview if that, that was part of the package. So I was aware of where Naval Base Kitsap was and who the, the command chaplain was. Now, God works in mysterious ways. I don't know how and why he did that. But after that, I did not hear anything else that he said. The next day, I was, I, I was sworn in as a lieutenant JG in the United States Navy. 
And that began the process of transitioning from civilian service, ministry, to military service as a chaplain in the Navy. It has been a long road. It's been a long road. It's been an arduous work, a lot of hard work, a lot of, a lot of long hours that I've put in this week, especially since we had VBS uh, at the chapel. But I'll tell you this. Everything that has happened in my life has led up to one thing. Ministry to the sailors, Marines, and Coast Guards in all three services. Every time I go to one of our sailors who is struggling, or every time a sailor comes into my office to pour their soul, because they have nobody else to do it with that they can trust, I understand why God has called me to do this. I'm not perfect by any means. I still continue to fail. I still don't understand all the attributes of God. I don't understand everything that God does in my life. But I've come to understand that when God calls you to do something, and just as in, in the, um, uh, our, our scripture reading today, when he brings the coal and touches your, your lips or your hands, or your feet, or your brain, for you to do a mission, he always asks the question that he asked the question in verse 8. Whom shall I send as a messenger to these people, and who will go for us? He makes the call, and then he asks the question, because he wants, us, he wants us to answer the way Isaiah answered this. He said, here I am, send me. Throughout my life as a pastor, there has been a common denominator. Is that churches think that by bringing a young pastor into their church, that pastor is going automatically to bring new members especially younger generation with kids. But the, the, the thing that happens is that that's the expectation, and also the expectation is that, they, that, they, that the pastor pours out all their energy into the generation that is currently in the church. And that's quite a difficult task for a pastor. God called you to this church, not just the Seventh-day Adventist church, but to the Poor Orchard Church for a reason. And that is for you to collectively work for the advancement of His kingdom into this world. You want to see younger people in this church? Then it is up to you. Not up to your pastor. It's up to you to bring this new generation. My job as a Navy chaplain is not to preach to them. My job is to show them in a practical way who Jesus is and what, they want, what He wants in their lives. Every time I go to a meeting with Him, I tell Him, hey, if you come to see me, I will not preach to you. I will not force my beliefs on you. If you want to talk about beliefs, if you want me to preach, I can do that every day, 24-7. But my job, the way I see it, is to bring Jesus closer to them. And the job of a church is to bring Jesus closer to the community. That's why we are called the Poor Orchard Seventh-day Adventist Church. If we are not in the community, then we are not doing our job. 
Might as well church, change our name to something else. It is your job. What has God called you to do in this church? If giving tithe and coming to meetings is all that God has called you to do, well, praise the Lord. But if he's called you to do something else in this church and you're not doing it, I would encourage that you go back to God and ask for a clarification of your job description. Because I can guarantee you that he will give it to you. Just as he has given it to me time and time and time again. The question still lingers. Whom shall we send and who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Are you ready for God to send you into whatever it is that you are? whether it's at work, at school, in retirement, at church? Are you ready for God to send you to where he has called you to be? That is the question that I leave with you today. I can't answer it for you. Only you can answer that. Get together with one another in this church and, say, and ask the question, how can we make our gifts work for Jesus? Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, throughout my life you have given us, you have given me plenty of, plenty of evidence what it is that you call me to do here there were times father where I did not listen and there were other times when I listened begrudgingly but ultimately Lord you have led me to this point to the point of sharing what you have taught me because Lord maybe there is one person in this church today who is going through the same things that I am. So Father, I pray that you will clarify the call that you have made to every single person in this church today. That they will come to your word with open minds and open hearts to discover what it is that you call them to do. And that when they discover it, Father, that they will be able to link with others who you have called to do the same thing in this church. Father, I want your mission to be the mission of this church. I want your vision to be the, the vision of this church. I want them to be your hands and feet. I want them to be your eyes. I want them to be your mouthpiece, Lord that other people will come to the knowledge of who you are because of what they have. Father, bless their pastor, Pastor Dustin, as he continues to lead this church. Give him wisdom and understanding, but most importantly, Father, give him your vision so that he may lead this church to where it is needed the most. Thank you, Lord, for always speaking to us and for allowing us to be here this morning. Take us home safely after a potluck and may we truly be able to enjoy the Sabbath.